When Air Force vet went out to a bar near the beach and separated from his friends for a bit, no one thought much of it. But when he never showed up the following morning or answered anyone's phone calls, everyone started to grow concerned. Did something happen to him? A search ensued, but investigators weren't able to find any sign of the man. His personal belongings were nowhere to be found, his phone and bank records showed nothing, and there was no evidence to suggest foul play. Did this guy just fall in the ocean and never wash up? It was a Saturday night in March of 2016 when 36-year-old Mike Van Zantz decided to meet up with some of his friends at the Hermosa Beach Pier. Mike was an Air Force veteran who worked at the Edwards Air Force Base and lives in an apartment in Lancaster, California. He was a father to three kids, Keaton, Jaden, and Kylia, and was in the middle of getting a divorce from his wife. That day, Mike went to Jaden's basketball game at the local YMCA and had lunch with his three kids. After finishing lunch at around 3 p.m., Mike dropped the kids off with their mom and his ex, Chris Shane. He then headed for Hermosa Beach, which was about 80 miles away from Lancaster. On the two-hour drive, Mike called his two brothers and talked to them on the phone for a bit. He also talked to his ex-girlfriend, Monique. So that night, Mike parked his car at a hotel and Ubered to a bar called The Underground. He was invited there by a coworker, Jamie. A few days earlier, Jamie told Mike she was going to the bar in Hermosa with her friends Kyle, Mary, and Randall to watch some UFC fights and asked if he wanted to come. Mike, being a UFC-loving guy in the need of a night out, said yes. The only person he knew in the group was Jamie, so this was actually his first time meeting everyone else. But Mike was a happy-go-lucky guy who quickly became friends with people, so it wasn't really awkward at all. At the bar, there were videos and photos taken of Mike watching the fight and shooting the shit with his friends. They all made plans to stay at a quality inn and suites in the area. After the fight was over, Mike and his pals left the underground and walked around the Pier Plaza. At 10.15, they got in line at the restaurant called American Junkie. While the group was in line at the restaurant, Mike popped over to a nearby liquor store to use the bathroom. During that time, his friends decided to ditch the line and find another restaurant to go to. Jamie and her crew thought they'd just call Mike and tell him that they decided to relocate, but when they gave his phone a ring, it went straight to voicemail. His phone was dead. Well, after calling Mike about 20 times, the group decided to go on with their evening. Jamie also mentioned that Mike, who was a very social guy, could have run into the same other friends or maybe even met a girl. Over the course of the next few hours, surveillance cameras around the pier plaza caught Mike popping in and out of bars and restaurants along the strip, looking for his crew. At some point that night, Mike went back into the liquor store to grab some booze before he was seen on camera headed towards the beach. The last time Mike was seen on camera was when he walked toward the beach at 11.27 that night. From that moment on, no one knows what happened to Mike or where exactly he went. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but it rained that night, so some of the video footage is kind of hard to see. Well, Mike never checked into his hotel room that night, and his group of friends didn't see him around again either. The next morning, he still hadn't shown up, and his car was in the same place he left it in the night before, the hotel parking lot. Jamie thought that maybe Mike had gotten a little too drunk and ended up in cuffs or a hospital bed, so he started calling nearby jails and emergency rooms. But after calling all the local spots, it was clear that something else must have happened to Mike. She ended up driving back to Lancaster and even stopped by Mark's apartment to see if he was there somehow. Jamie noticed his car wasn't there, and when she banged on the door, no one answered. The same day, Mike's ex-girlfriend Monique texted him when she got back from Vegas, and his brother Tyler tried calling him. Again, no answer. The following Monday, which was two days after Mike was last seen, he was supposed to take an insurance form to Christine because one of their kids had an oral surgery scheduled that day. Mike never showed up. Christine texted and called Mike, but he didn't answer. She just assumed that he'd stayed up late the night before or something, but as more time passed, she started to reach out to a few other people to check on Mike. He was very family oriented, so it seemed a bit odd that he would flake on something that important. Christine texted Monique and Tyler, but neither of them knew what was up with Mike either. That had to be awkward for the ex-wife to text the ex-girlfriend. Christine then called the Air Force Base Mike worked at, and that's when she found out he hadn't shown up for his shift. Moments after that, Jamie called the base as well. She wasn't working that day, so she thought that she'd call and ask if Mike showed up, just to make sure. But sadly, she didn't get the answer she was hoping for. Once she realized that Christine was searching for Mike too, Jamie filed a missing persons report. When police officers were first informed of Mike's disappearance, they pulled that whole, he's an adult, he will probably show up soon type of thing. 
One of the first persons who was notified about Mike's disappearance was his brother Tyler, who lived in Baltimore at the time. Tyler didn't tell his parents at first because he didn't want them to panic, but he immediately knew something bad happened because this wasn't like Mike at all to leave without warning. On Tuesday morning, Tyler booked a flight to LA to help search for his brother. Mike and Tyler's other brother, Charles, followed suit. And even though Mike was separated from his wife, Chris Shane, she joined in on the search too. And after all, they were married for like 15 years and he was the father of the three kids. Tyler and Charles mentioned Chris Shane seemed super distraught. And that was probably because the news was so shocking and scary, but it's possible that she had something to do with Mike's disappearance. I mean, if they were getting a divorce, there had to be a decent amount of drama between the couple. So in the beginning stages of the search for Mike, the detectives were super lax. Even though they searched the Pier Plaza area to look for clues, went to the beach to see if they could find any of Mike's belongings, and talked to people in the area, asking if they saw him that night, the investigators refused to search the water at that point because there was no witnesses who reported seeing him get in the water. Tyler was worried that they weren't trying hard enough. Due to the lack of witnesses and the fact that the camera footage of Mike didn't lead to much, Tyler knew that the more time that had passed, the harder it would be to find his brother. Mike's phone records and bank statements were searched, but his phone didn't show any activity after 10.30 that night since his battery died and there was no charges made on debit cards or credit cards. Dang, like where did this guy go? He just vanished. About four days after the incident, an investigator found a clip from a surveillance camera in the area with Mike in it. He was headed to the east side of the town with a guy who looked just like Randall, one of the other people in the UFC watching group from that night. Maybe Randall was hiding something about that night. But within the next few days, the specialist was able to enhance the clip where it was revealed that the men spotted in the footage weren't Mike or Randall. They were just some other random dudes that looked like them. And in the weeks following the event, a search dog was brought out to the area, cut Mike's scent at the liquor store, but after that, it lost its scent and wasn't able to trace Mike any further. Now, something you should know about Mike, though, is that he was a skilled scuba diver who loved to swim. According to Tyler, Mike was known for going swimming when intoxicated. A few months earlier, the brothers had met up in San Diego, and one night, Mike ended up jumping in the ocean twice to go swimming after having too many drinks. So maybe... Mike went for a dip in the ocean at Hermosa and got caught under a strong wave. It was pretty rainy that night, so one theory is that El Nino currents tossed his body further out into the ocean, causing him to eventually drown. But even if Mike decided to take a midnight swim in the ocean, he would have left his personal belongings behind, right? Like, Tyler said Mike would often take off his shoes and hide his phone and wallet inside. If he did leave those items behind, you would think someone would either turn them in or try to steal them. But none of Mike's belongings were ever turned in, and there was no proof of his phone or cards being used since that night, so it really was starting to look like Mike fell off the pier into the ocean or was pushed by somebody and be so difficult to find. Like, Mike literally vanished, and no one was able to discover or find anything. Did he run away? Was he abducted? Did he fall into the ocean? The photos of Mike were plastered all around town, shown on the news and talked about on the radio. People were even told to be on the lookout for a 36-year-old white male who was about six feet tall and 190 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. But even after numerous flyers, Facebook posts, videos about Mike's case circulated in the no local Hermosa Beach area as well as the World Wide Web, no one was able to provide any type of information. As much as it seemed like Mike fell into the ocean, his body never washed up. And now it's been over five years and you'd think it would have surfaced at this point. In addition to traditional police officers, lifeguards, members of the Coast Guard, and Mike's Air Force colleagues were on the lookout for him, and still nothing. So maybe if we knew more about who Mike was and what he was going through, we'd be able to decide if the theory that he ended his own life is valid. Mike grew up in Michigan in a bit of a broken household. His parents divorced when he was two, and he was raised primarily by his mom. He had no real father figure in his life, so that's one of the main reasons why he took his role as a father so seriously. And in January 2000, Mike met his wife at an Air Force base in Japan. The two immediately fell for one another, and in October of 2001, they got married. Mike and Chris Shane had three kids, and in 2006, their family was relocated to a military base in Lancaster, California. After serving in the Air Force for 12 years, including two tours in Iraq, Mike retired and took a civilian job at the base. Over the next few years, Mike and Chris Shane fell out of love, and in 2014, they separated. Even still, Mike and Christian remained on good terms. Mike moved to an apartment nearby and took turns with the kids as he and Christian had joint custody. 
In 2015, Mike started dating Monique, who was 24 years old. The two dated for a few months, but eventually Mike called the relationship off, saying he wasn't ready. After the breakup, Monique said she remained best friends with Mike. From lovers to friends? I mean, that's kind of a, it's a fun demotion, I guess. But would it be enough for Monique to want him gone? Like, I don't know. Well, actually, she was in Vegas when this all went down, so it's not really a possibility. She was also trying to help him find Mike during the whole investigation. Anyway, at this point in Mike's life, things were pretty rocky. He went from living in a home with his wife and three kids to living in an apartment while having to shuffle the kids back and forth between his apartment and Krishan's place. And now he's in his very first relationship post-separation. That had to be a lot for him to take in. But was it enough to lead him to want to take his own life? And even though things seemed bad for Mike, a few months before his disappearance, he was actually approved for a mortgage on a house. One of the biggest things for Mike was making sure that his kids had enough room to live when they were stayed in. He was not big on apartment living, so securing this home was a big step in him feeling happy and confident with where he was in his life. He was set to move in at the end of March, but sadly he never made it home to live a day in his new home. In May of 2018, an episode of Investigation Discoveries Disappeared that covered Mike's case was aired. His friends and family hoped someone would see that episode and recall something from that night or about Mike that could lead to more answers. But as of now, no one has come forward with any information, but Mike's loved ones has not given up hope. They continue to share his story on social media and long to find a resolution someday. For Shane, had to break the gut-wrenching news to the kids and now they will finish out the rest of their childhood without their loving, supportive father. It truly is sad to think that everyone in Mike's circle has to go about life without knowing what actually happened to him. Did he get slain? Was he pushed in the water? Did he get caught under a wave after jumping in on his own accord? Or maybe he got lost and washed up somewhere else. I mean, what do you think? After you let me know your theory in the comments below, go tell someone you love them. Life's too short to not indulge every now and then. Thanks for watching, guys.